We all know what it feels like to lose some freedom, to be prevented from driving as fast as we want, going where we want. But over the last two years, many of us have even lost the freedom to earn a living, to study, to take our children to parks, even to be with loved ones at the end of their lives. And yet Canada has long held the reputation as the freest country in the world. For good reason, we have a charter that guarantees fundamental freedoms, conscience and religion, thought, belief, expression, peaceful assembly and association. It makes you wonder, are we entitled to this reputation or is our commitment to freedom simply an illusion? And what does it mean to be free anyway? This is a philosophically loaded question. There is the metaphysical sense of the question, whether or not human beings have free will. But I think what really concerns us today is political freedom. How much freedom we enjoy as citizens relative to each other and to the state. Freedom is basic to political thinking, especially in a liberal democracy. But how should freedom be understood and why is it important? Let's start with a thought experiment. It comes from Henrik Ibsen's play, A Doll's House. The main figures in the play are Torvald, a successful banker, and his wife, Nora. Under 19th century law, Torvald has enormous power over his wife's actions, but he adores her and denies her nothing. She can go where she wants, have the friends she wants, raise her children as she likes. True, Torvald bans the macaroons she loves, but even that isn't much of a restriction, since she can hide them in her skirt. Furthermore, Torvald does not penalize her choices or manipulate or deceive her in her exercise of those choices. But is Nora truly free? Many political philosophers understand freedom as non-interference. By this standard, since Nora isn't really interfered with, we must say she is free. But Nora clearly lives under Torvald's thumb. She is stifled. She is a doll in a doll's house, not a free woman. And she apparently doesn't feel free, which we see at the end of the play, when in an act of bold self-assertion, she slams the door as she leaves her family, declaring her true independence from Torvald. As philosopher Philip Pettit says, being allowed to do what we want by someone else without interference is the lowest and least valuable form of freedom. You simply can't be free if you live under the thumb of another person, even if that person is kind to you and allows you for the most part to do what you want. But being allowed to act is not the same as being free to act. As the philosopher Isaiah Berlin said, being free is not just a matter of being left alone. It's a kind of self-realization, knowing all the options for how to live a good life being able to decide among them for ourselves, and then being able to act on those decisions without coercion or consequence. We need to be able to choose how to raise a family and educate our children, what vocation to pursue, what religion to practice, what we say to one another in public spaces, as long as we respect others' rights to do so as well. In order to be a free person, we need more than prescribed free choice or even care. We need not to be dominated by another, and this fact needs to be registered as a matter of common awareness. We need laws that protect our fundamental freedoms, politicians that represent our interests and not those of higher political actors, journalism that acts as a system of checks and balances when our fundamental freedoms are encroached on, and most of all, we need to exercise these freedoms, think, believe, speak, gather, or we will lose the ability and possibly even the desire to do so. This fuller sense of freedom is, as Isaiah Berlin says, the truer and more humane ideal. Thanks for hanging out with me today. If you liked that video, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the democracyfund.ca slash donate.